Okay, it's five o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get this kicked off. Um, it is officially five o'clock, so unofficial happy hour presentation over here. Feel free to grab a beer, come and sit, enjoy yourself, drink as much as you need for this to be enjoyable. Come on over. So to start with a little bit of background on myself and the company, my name is Mike, I'm the VP of Engineering for Cumberland Additive. Uh, we're a service bureau, we've been in existence since 2006, doing industrial additive manufacturing in plastics and metals. And our core focus is powder bed fusion, both electron beam and laser. And then with that, all the ancillary activities. Um, so that's everything from procurement of powder, through post-processing, finishing, non-destructive testing, heat treating, you name it. Um, a key part of this is we try to bring our customers along for, we'll call it a journey, where we want to develop products with our customers and make sure that we're integrated as early as possible to, to increase the success. And I'll, I'll get into that a little in more detail in the presentation. Um, but part of that could be engineering services, um, it could be consulting on just geometry changes, material selection, heat treat options, and that sort of thing. We are AS9100D accredited as well as ITAR. And for me, that's a very big part of our success is having a business and QMS system that can support what we're doing. So as I mentioned, core competency is powder bed fusion. We've elected to use this technology because we believe it is the most industrialized AM process. We're competing against traditional machining, against castings, forgings, and the like in terms of mechanical performance, um, ability to have structural designs and that sort of thing. Um, and you can see from the spider diagram of how it compares. So, so is CNC probably having the biggest competition there in terms of resolution, isotropy, mechanical performance. There are certain advantages to AM though, right? There's geometries that CNC can't produce. Um, there's also some efficiencies with smaller batch sizes, changes in design, um, feedstock prices, and that sort of thing. So I've come up with my recipe for success. And just like anything, you gotta take this with a grain of salt. It doesn't apply in all cases. But I think this is a pretty good path and it's something we found success with. Uh, I'm not gonna read each word of this, but I wanna summarize the, the philosophy and ideas here. So the first is to understand your process and to make sure you're, you're seeking out a supplier or within your own internal company, have a process that can sustain the production you need. That can seem really simple, but really anybody with deep pockets can go buy an industrial additive machine. And the OEMs will gladly sell it to you, and that machine itself is capable of producing a high quality part. The challenge is, is your process and everything surrounding that also capable of doing that repeatably and reliably? Because anybody can do something one time, a total fluke, but can you do it over and over? That's what we care about in industrial AM. Uh, and then, kind of way down on the list in number three, I've got select your part candidates based on criticality, which may seem kind of late in the process, but if you do it earlier, you may be pigeonholing yourself into a certain technology, a certain material, a certain heat treating option, without understanding if you have a process or supplier capable of that, which is why I have it in that order. And then, just like anything else, it goes down to your personal risk tolerance. Do you wanna spend lots of dollars to qualify a part and lots of time to do that? Do you want to spend not very many dollars or time and qualify it? And then what is the output from that? Do you have to do more testing in, in, in production? Um, do you possibly have more risk of fallout or yield issues or failures in the field? So you have to find your balance. And then lastly is trust but verify. So now you've done all this qualification, you're ready to go to production. Can you just produce parts and send them straight to the field? In most cases, probably not. So then now you have to decide on what your threshold is there. How much testing are you gonna do in production? So backing up a bit to understanding your process. I said the machine OEMs would sell you a machine if you have enough money, and they will. And that machine is usually pretty reliable. I think the presentation from GE previous to me proved that. They're doing a lot of rigor to develop the machine and make sure it does have that capability. Um, but we've gone the extra step. So we have six SLM 280s. We've done a lot of development on those platforms, and we were an early adopter of that technology. So with that, we had the early adopter effects of having to figure out the things and the bugs that hadn't quite been worked out. So this is one such example here. Uh, in this case, the gas flow mechanism on that machine was such that the actual velocity of the argon shielding gas moving across the plate 
a pretty large variation in, in different spatial sections. So we mapped that out to see what we were getting because we sensed that we could have variation in mechanical performance across the plate, which is a big no-no in production. You want to fill that plate up and you don't want to have to exclude portions of the plate because they're not performing as well as, well as they should. So after changes, the, the, we worked with the machine OEM to give them feedback data on this. They made hardware changes to the machine to improve this design. And that improved the flow of the shielding gas. And then you see the, the output there on the, the bottom plate, um, which means that we can basically print across the plate with a certain level of isotropy. We, we're getting equivalent mechanical performance. We can utilize the whole plate and everybody's happy. But if we had just accepted the fact that we bought a machine that's industrialized, we get ready to start production, we tell our customers we're ready to go, this would have been a huge surprise in production. So it's that level of rigor and understanding of your process that I think is, is critical. Uh, the next, next example is about material selection, heat treat selection, or maybe a combination of both. Um, so the, the horizontal lines are showing limits for uh, API 6A CRA. And the variation in the histograms, the, the the one on the left is the machine state with no heat treating. The one on the right is with heat treating. So you can see that you're basically getting an inverse in properties. So your tensile properties are going up with heat treating. Your elongation is going down. And you need to find a fine balance. Um, that cycle, the cycles that you use for heat treating, can change that pretty drastically. So that's one more guiding factor that either come from a standardization body, from our experience, your experience, et cetera, but something you have to know. You can't blindly go into the process and assume you'll get consistent results. And then in terms of standardization, there's tons of standardization bodies out there. I've got many named in this in the table over here. The, the main point here being that you've got to stick with one and select one that most closely fits your business need. I think that across all the standardization bodies, there seems to be sort of a generalized feel and consensus about how they're structured. Although by industry, uh, by focus, by criticality of parts, there are differences. And if you end up going with a standardization body that is over-specking compared to your need, you're just paying more money without getting more value from it. Uh, those also will help establish between the supplier uh, and, and the customer, or even yourself if you're doing your own printing, what has to be tested, what the familiarity, and eliminate the what ifs that come up in the process. Okay, so general production process qualification flow. You wanna do a process qualification. Is the system that you have, your equipment, your people, your processes, your business system, your QMS, capable of repeatedly producing a part? The very high level of that. And how much money do you wanna to spend to prove that? That can be an, an on-site qualification uh, of your supplier or yourself. That can be um, a lot of testing that you do on a process that's not focused on parts. So maybe you're doing multiple builds with tensile specimens scattered across them, fatigue, creep, whatever you need for your, for your, your application. Or can you also leverage data you have? And this is one area that we've been really successful in that we've been doing production series processing for a number of years. And so we are habitually taking data from all of those builds. So every single metal build we do, there's tensile bars on that build. So over time, we, if you say, I want a, sn a snapshot from uh, 2020, from January through March of your process control, we can go grab that and show you tensile performance. So we know exactly how the process is trending. And if we have an outlier, we can flag that internally to fix the process ahead of time. And so this is the whole mentality of not trying to catch everything on the back end. Then you go into part qualification, you're looking at design considerations, special features, and things of that sort. And then on to production where you're trying to decide what's the minimal amount of testing I need to do to make sure that the output part is good. Because you don't want to front, you don't want to backload all the testing at final inspection because it's too late at that point. Uh, one philosophy that's not often used that I think is adaptable is the idea, idea of this risk priority number. So if you've if you worked in automotive or aerospace, you might have dealt with process failure mode and effects, control plans, and things like that. They use a numbering system called the RPN. And you're basically grading each of your risk factors based on their severity, if it happens, the probability of occurrence, and then the probability that you can detect it if it gets through those first couple stages. And so this is a good way of balancing how much effort you put into the qualification. Um, like I said, it's all about money and time. So you can use that sort of mentality to decide how much you apply to it. Then what's a control? There's tons of stuff on here. I won't read all of them, and you probably know most of them. But there's a lot of considerations to take into account. It's much more than just buying a machine and, and printing parts. 
Um, this is something that you want to define early on based on criticality of the part, but you have to be careful not to overspec it. Um, one thing, one facet that I'll address here is reuse count on powder feedstock. Uh, we've had various customers that have required a certain use count of material, and that's based on their own empirical data, uh, maybe a shot in the dark, a, a number that feels comfortable. But in that essence, you're, you're cycling material and you're adding a count each time you use it. And then you're saying after 30 or 40 counts, that material is no longer usable. But you're not really doing that based on data. So you're assuming your material is evolving either physically or chemically so that it's no longer usable. The methodology we take instead is we, at various intervals, test the material, uh, chemistry or physical testing, to ensure that it's still within spec. So you're, it's more of a proof in the pudding type thing. You're already testing each build with tensile specimens on the output end, plus you're testing the feedstock. So the, the opportunity for there to be errors or, or missteps in the middle are very minimal. That's how you manage risk. Oh, I, I do want to comment on this too. One, one success story we've had with this is with one of our trusted partners, IMI CCI, and it's been um, a product development that started with a few initial parts that were, you know, small little parts the size of your fist maybe. Now we're doing much larger parts, and we wouldn't have been able to progress through that without this sort of methodology and being able to show that we have repeatability in the process, earn their trust, let them earn their customer's trust, and, and pass that along. Okay, so what sort of things are we looking at for repeatability? Um, it's all about statistics. Anybody can do it once, like I said. So performance over time for tensile strength, something we're logging uh, on every single build. When we have a little outlier like you see on that first graph there, then we know to attack that. Is that a, is that a powder issue? Is it a processing issue? Is it a new pers per personnel that was introduced to the machining process or to the printing process? Uh, and then on the right side, machine to machine variability. We're running, we have 12 uh, printers on site, we have six SLM 280s, and so between those, can we take one part and put it on any of those printers with the same material and feel comfortable that it's gonna produce the same result? So we've done those sort of comparison studies as well. I mean, the, the short answer is there's always variability. They're never gonna be a one-for-one -one replica, but with statistics, you're able to show that within a reasonable am amount of certainty, it's gonna be the same product in the end. Lots of lot variability. So there are variations in material lot. We get material testing reports from all of our vendors, but there is a possibility that something happens that we're not testing for or we catch. So we also we test for that to see, and that's a big indicator of mechanical performance on the back end too. So in terms of um, weighing risks, you can test the, the powder lots in the front end, ensure that your feedstock input is good, and then on the back end you're doing tensile testing so you know that the actual part integrity is good. And then on the right side, a question that comes up often is, how is your mechanical performance in different directions, X, Y versus Z orientation? So there is clearly an appreciable difference here. Uh, the key being, is that difference enough that you wanna have to test X, Y and or Z specimens in every production build? Or can you accept the fact that there's some variation, we'll call it less than 5%, and only test Z? And then you minimize your testing costs in production to one bar or two bars versus two bars or six bars. And then using statistics, you can look at these, these values. So PP, PPK, CP, CPK, looking at the centeredness of the process, how centered it is within a normal histogram, and then how tight the data is. Do you have a bunch of outliers where you're randomly having something that falls over the upper control limit or under the lower control limit, and then you're ch constantly chasing issues? In this case, these are both decent um, PPKs and CPKs that you'd roll into production with, but you'd want to continue to improve this in production. So in conclusion, like I said, you can, anybody can buy a printer. You can focus on just that in your production, but I think it's all about the bigger QMS. Do you have a system that can sustain that long term? Uh, and that's a system of processes and procedures above and beyond AS. It's a culture. It's a, a, a mentality of testing and pushing that testing to the front end of the process so you're not putting all the weight on production. Do you really understand your manufacturing tools? Do you understand the process? Are you and your customer on the same page with what the requirements are? How do you balance risk? That's always critical. Uh, you can have more risk and possibly less cost. You can put more, more cost into it on the front end and have less risk. Um, but all these are competing factors against traditional technology. If you put a whole bunch of costs into an AM part, and maybe it's, not, it's no longer valid compared to a traditionally machined part or a casting. And so you have to sort of balance that. Uh, 
then decide what to fully mitigate versus just inspect for. That was the whole idea of risk priority number I mentioned. And then in, in production, trust but verify. Decide what you're gonna test on each build and continue to maintain that regimen as you go through production. So with that, I'll open up to many questions. Okay, Steve, did you have one? Really good question. So, so Steve's question was about, with all the standards that are out there, do any of them call, cover the metrics that should be required, uh, evaluated, concerned, or thought about in production? To my knowledge, no. So they're kind of leaving that open to the customer and supplier to decide what that is. And I think that's important too, because I think aerospace probably has a bit of a different mentality about this, aerospace and automotive especially, on repeatability. Uh, and people often think that in oil and gas, it's lower volume, it's less, less criticality, but I mean, we, we listened to the panel discussions earlier, and Carlo from ConocoPhillips said it really well, that they're really concerned with the criticality of the part and the, the safety factor of it, right? Like even though it's not people flying on an airplane, if, if something goes wrong in oil and gas, there's still repercussions. It's either downtime or it's somebody getting hurt. And so I think, yeah, that's a really good consideration, Steve, but not that I know of, there are no standards that address that. Okay, good question. Question was, is there an MES system that we're using, a management or a manufacturing execution system to track and keep, you know, keep track of this and production? Uh, the answer is yes, but it's not a consolidated system. So we have an MRP system that we're using to control the flow of production. So that's the bombs and the routings, the sales orders that are controlling what goes to the floor, what all the steps are, who signs off and how it finishes. The testing data, once we finish whatever uh, whatever final heat treating the process gets, and, and these parts get, the tensile bars get separated from the actual production parts. Those go through a separate chain that we have and goes into a separate testing module. Uh, so it, that's one way to manage it. If there were an, an MES that can consolidate both, that would be nice. So, yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I, I could see where you're going with that. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't catch the first half of that. Yeah, so the question was, uh, based on our experience, what are the major, major applications within oil and gas? Uh, I think it's really widespread. Oil and gas, I think as everyone sort of acknowledged, even in the panel discussions earlier, is a bit behind in the adoption curve for AM. So people are sort of crawling, walking, running with it. Uh, we've had a lot of success in smaller components, just because, of course, additive is, is focused on that. Um, a lot of upstream components tend to be smaller than offshore components, per se, because of just the sheer size necessary for that. Um, so a lot of downhole tools, because of the smaller packaging are good for that, uh, valve components for that, couplings, seal rings, I, I feel like there's an application in every aspect of oil and gas. It just has to be sort of sought out. Because even the larger offshore applications, um, things that are 200 feet long, have smaller couplings to them and seal rings and gaskets that can be made out of additive. Even though the, the physical footprint of the, the additive manufacturing machine, especially powder bed fusion, is a constraint in some cases. But with the, with the larger format machines, you can print, we like to say beach ball size parts now, which encompasses a lot of you know, relatively you know, smaller sized parts for even offshore oil and gas. Yeah, go, cool. thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>